Peace be upon you. So let's say you're walking on the street and you see someone, they got a bell and a sign on and they're yelling profanities towards the poor. They're cursing the poor. How would this make you feel? What would be your reaction? Would you want to get in this person's face? Would you want to tell them off, tell them how despicable they are? You know, what they're doing is disgusting. Or would you just be, you know, completely complacent and just ignore them and walk on and do nothing? Now, they did this experiment. It was in the UK. And um, basically, they had a guy, he had a sandwich sign, and he has a bell, and he's yelling, you know, F the poor, F the poor. And people are getting genuinely upset with reason. They're getting in his face. They're telling him off and, um, you know, saying that I used to be poor. I used to be homeless. How dare you? What's wrong with you? What kind of a person are you? And I'm sure it made the people feel really good. But then the next day, the guy went out with a similar sign, same thing, had a bell, had a sign, and it said, feed the poor, feed the poor. And, you know, hundreds of people are passing by him. I don't think anyone stopped to go and say, hey, is everything okay? How can I help? You know, do you need any money? Where can I donate to? And it goes to show that, you know, obviously we know from the Quran, we're supposed to give to the poor. We're supposed to give during the good times, the bad times, publicly and privately. But the purpose of this social experiment that I took away from it is, are we only reacting? Are we only responding when we are enticed, when we're provoked. Because there's three kinds of people. The first kind of people are the ones who are indifferent. Irrespective if someone's cursing the poor or asking for money or nothing, they just kind of like ignore it. They just keep moving on. They have, they're indifferent to the situation. The second kind of people are a little better. They're the ones that when they hear about this injustice, they hear about someone, you know, provoking them, uh, yelling profanities towards a uh, class of people that, you know, um, aren't affluent in society, uh, that they get upset, they get angry, they, they want to do something. But the aspect is, are they willing to take that next step? And rather than just virtue signal about, you know, how angry and outraged they are, are they actually going out to help the poor, to give to charity? Because that's the third group of people irrespective if they're provoked or they're enticed or they're not, they're going to do what they need to in order to be righteous. They're going to give to the char uh, to charity. They're going to give to the poor. They're going to do good deeds. They don't need to be provoked in order to do so. Irrespective of the guys asking for money or not, they're going to continue giving to charity. And those are the, the kind of people we want to be. We don't want to just react when we're provoked, when we're enticed. Now that's good. It shows that we care. It shows that there's something in us that is saying that we need to be upset about this injustice. And the aspect is we don't want to stop there. There's a verse in the Bible in Proverbs 9.10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And there's a lot of discussion. What does this mean that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? And in the Quran in 3.175, it reads, it is the devil's system to instill fear into his subjects. Do not fear them and fear me instead if you are believers. And people ask, they say, why should we fear God? You know, God who's most gracious, most merciful, most kind, who's given us so much blessings. Why should we fear God? And the aspect is the same thing. It's a stage. If we have, if we're indifferent to God's uh, uh, retribution of stepping out of God's graces or God's blessings by being in God's graces, then there's really no hope for us. But if we start with the aspect of being fearful of stepping out of God's graces, doing the things that displease God, then hopefully it's going to point us in the right direction towards God's graces. And as we start worshiping God and we start meditating and thinking about God, we're going to realize that it's not that we need to fear God. We need to love God. We should love God. That we uh, need God. That all of a sudden fear turns to devotion to God alone. And this is part of the process, you know. When we're enticed, when we're provoked, and we see injustice, okay, it's good to be upset. It's good to voice your opinion. But we shouldn't stop there. We need to continue going. We need to continue moving forward to progress past that. Otherwise, we're going to be in the cycle of just being angry, being uh, uh, outraged, you know, and putting that out into the world. And you think about that. It's like, you know, being, <laughs> being angry and outraged is not a uh, virtue in itself. The question is, what do you do when you're outraged? What do you do when you're angry? Are you going to do something that's going to fix the situation? Or are you just going to tell the world about how, you know, how much injustice there is and how terrible things are? Because that in itself isn't going to do it. 
In the Quran, God tells us in 485, says, whoever mediates a good deed receives a share of the credit thereof, and whoever mediates an evil work incurs a share thereof. God controls all things. Whatever ideas we're putting out into the world, whatever engagements we have with people in the world, be it face-to-face or on social media, we bear part of that uh, share of the credit or the evil work that we put out there. Now, when we put out a negative review, when we go out and we show our outrage to the world, or we treat people in content because we're, we're disgruntled and unhappy ourselves, that has a ripple effect. Think about this. If you're in the uh, uh, line at a grocery store and you're upset about the world, you're upset about the situation that's going on, and because of that, you act a little impatiently towards the cashier, and that causes them to have a negative feeling in their uh, core that has a ripple effect on the next people in line for the day, we bear a part of that sin. Similarly, if we put that aside and we think about all the things to be happy and joyful and appreciative for, and we smile and we're uh, caring with that individual during that engagement, and that causes them to be happy and grateful with the next person in line and the next person in line, then we also bear part of that good deed. And it's even worse when it comes to social media. You know, when we put things out there that are constantly just bringing people down, giving them reason to be angry and uh, viewing of the injustice of the world and how terrible things are, and they carry that load with them into life in their engagements, in their interactions with their family, with their friends, you know, is that something we want to be responsible for? We see that outrage, it has this contagion effect. It has this impact of being able to spread, and it becomes very hard in order to contain. There's a saying from uh, people who have businesses on Yelp. They say for each negative review, they need 10 positive reviews to outweigh that one negative review. And it's even worse than that. They did a study. They found out that if I go to a restaurant and have a poor experience, and I go and I tell my friend about my poor experience, my friend is less likely to go to that restaurant than I am who had the experience. Now, why is that? It's because when I communicate my poor experience to my friend, all I'm focusing on is all the bad things about the restaurant. I don't focus about any of the positives that could have taken place. The fact that the place might have been clean, you know, the appetizer might have been good, uh, you know, the the greeting when I got in was friendly, the atmosphere was nice. These small details that I overlook to focus on the negative puts more of a negative perception on my friend who's never been there than me who had the experience. Because when I reflect back to the experience, I can remember some of those subtle details that I conveniently overlooked. And it's the same thing when we complain about you know, injustice and atrocities and all these terrible things without thinking about the upside, some of the blessings that exist as well. We're impacting that same effect to the people we engage with. Now, again, it's not to uh, diminish the fact that there's injustice, there's atrocities that take place that need to be, you know, people need to uh, be aware of. But if that's all we focus on, all we uh, disseminate to the world, you know, we're in essence creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of that world. Now, we have a limited capacity of time, of uh, focus that we can uh, allocate And if we are going to choose to selectively only focus on the bad, then eventually it's going to drive us to be unappreciative, to not see all the blessings that God has given us. And for every negative thing that's out there, there's an infinite amount of blessings that God has provided as well. And again, it's not to say that we don't focus on the things that are bad in order to improve them, to uh, provide justice, to fix them. But if that's all we're focusing on, then it shows there's a problem. Now, why is it that the human being is so drawn to outrage, to being upset, to being angry? You know, if you look around in nature, let's look at just mammals. You know, this is not a characteristic of other animals. Um, There's a book, it's written, uh, Why uh, Zebras Don't Have Ulcers. And it's talking about, you know, zebra, when a lion tries to attack it, as soon as the threat is gone, the zebra is back into being a zebra. It's not threatening. It's not, you know, it's uh, anxiety isn't there. It's doing what it does because it doesn't need to be, you know, in that state anymore. It uses it 
as it needs, and then it goes back to its normal state. But the human being is different. The human being dwells on it. And somehow it's able to like something that we know inherently is unpalatable. You know, who likes being miserable and sad and angry and outraged? But the human being, it does. And it's related with something else, and it seems unrelated, but I'll try to tie it together. And that's of spicy food. For years, scientists have been trying to figure out why human beings like spicy food. You know, what is it about spicy food that draws human beings? Because there is not a single mammal on this planet, aside from the uh, human being, that likes spicy food. Actually, I take that there is one. It's a tree shrew, and uh, it likes peppers. But they found out when they researched it that the uh, receptors to taste spicy in that tree shrew is uh, uh, there's a mutation that they don't taste the spiciness. They don't get the burning sensation in their mouth. So aside from the tree shrew, the human being is the only mammal that has an appetite for spicy food. And they used to think that the reason was it had to do with refrigeration and the masking of taste because if you looked at the you know ancient uh, recipes in the more uh, harsh climates, like the, the ones that are very hot, uh, food doesn't preserve well, um, they used a lot of spicy food and they believed that was to mask the taste of meat that's not fresh. But, you know, last hundred years we've had refrigeration, yet the... <laughs> desire for spicy food is not diminished. So why is that? Um, one of the, the findings they had was that they believe this is actually a social construct, this desire for spicy food. That a baby, when they first uh, have spicy food, they're not going to like it. But eventually, they eat it because everyone else eats it, if, especially if that's what's served to them. And our brains have this interesting trick where if we do something often enough, it's going to make us believe that we genuinely like it. So they believe that spicy food is the same thing. That first they ate it because, um, you know, they needed it in essence to mask the taste of the meat. But eventually it got to the point where people ate it. And because they ate it, they drew a uh, connection with it. And then they started liking it. And then they just started desiring it. And it got to the point where all of a sudden that if you give someone who really likes spicy food food without any spice, it tastes dull, it tastes bland, it has no flavor. That they've built this tolerance towards spicy, but at the same time, it dulls their other sensations that if they don't feel that spiciness, they don't feel the hot, the burning, then the food just doesn't taste the same. So the human being is able to take something that's unpalatable and not only make it palatable, make it desirable. And outrage and anger is the same thing is the fact that, you know, at the beginning, you're thrown into a situation that makes you angry. And eventually, you start building a tolerance towards anger. You start building a tolerance towards uh, outrage. And eventually, you start looking for reasons to be angry, reasons to being outraged. There's a book, it's called Molecules of Emotion. It was showing that anytime we have an emotion, peptides are being released through our bloodstream. And our cells have receptors for these peptides. And as our cells replicate, whatever emotion we've been feeling the most, it's going to create more receptors in our cells for that emotion, creating this positive feedback loop where if you're feeling happy and joyful or sad and depressed and angry, whatever emotion that we're feeling, our physiology is literally changing to desire more of that emotion. And the devil knows this and the devil utilizes this to pull us out of God's graces, to make us unappreciative. In 1764, it says, You may entice them with your voice and mobilize all your forces and all your men against them and share in their money and children and promise them anything the devil promises is no more than an illusion. The devil entices us with his voice. He mobilizes force against us. <clears throat> he provokes us. He wants to get a rise out of us. And what's interesting is anything the devil does the God, uh, God can use to backfire against the devil's scheme. Because when we're enticed, when we're provoked about something that is genuine injustice, it shows that we care. It shows that we believe in right and wrong. But if we stop there and just dwell in this anger and this frustration and this injustice, and we never move beyond it, then we start seeing injustice and atrocities and reasons to be angry 
everywhere we look. We never get past that state. And that's what the devil wants. The devil wants us to view this world as a place that's full of injustice, that's full of reasons to be upset and bitter and angry and destroy it all. And this is what he's aiming for. But someone who's God conscious, who thinks about God, is going to see all the blessings in this world. Yeah, there are things that happen. There are injustices. But he's going to see all the reasons to be happy, to be appreciative, to, to uh, dwell in God's kingdom. Now, what's interesting is the sense of injustice. Injustice in this world does exist. But for a believer who believes in the hereafter, who believes this world is only a temporary stay, that every single person is going to be held account for everything good and bad they did, even an atom size or smaller, will never fear any injustice. Because this is something that injustice only exists if you don't believe in the hereafter. In 72.13 says, When we heard the guidance and we believe therein, anyone who believes in his Lord will never fear any injustice nor any affliction. Because anyone who's done anyone else wrong, they're going to pay for it. If not in this world, then in the hereafter. Anyone who's done an ounce of good, if they don't get their recompense in this world, they'll get in the hereafter manifold. So we should never fear injustice because this is what it comes down to. When we're outraged, when we're uh, upset, what we're saying in essence is that there is injustice. Someone needs to do something about it. Someone needs to speak up. And that's great, but we shouldn't end there because we realize that if someone is doing something that is cruel, that is terrible, that they will have their day where they will have to pay for these deeds. And yeah, we stand up for our rights. Yeah, we try to correct as many wrongs as we can. But to dwell in that state, to think that this world is terrible and there's so much injustice and so much reasons to be miserable, all we're doing is we're becoming unappreciative. In Surah 9 verse 15 it reads, He will also remove the rage from the believer's hearts. God redeems whomever he wills. God is omniscient, most wise. To be living in a state of perpetual rage, to always have something to be upset and angry about, it's not a healthy outcome and it's not the characteristic of a believer. In Surah 5 verse 2, we read about how the uh, believers of the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, that when they went to go perform their hajj, God is telling them, do not be provoked into aggression by your hatred of people who once prevented you from going to the sacred masjid. God is telling us to not be provoked into aggression. Do not be provoked or enticed into doing something that's unrighteous. God tells us in the Quran, we can stand up for our rights. But those who are more righteous are going to be patient, are going to trust in God. They're not going to be in a state of rage and anger. Because when we are, we act in ways that are not going to be pleasing to God. And we have to trust in God. God tells us in 1062 through 64, it says, Absolutely, God's allies have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. They are those who believe and lead a righteous life. For them, join happiness in this world as well as in the hereafter. This is God's unchangeable law, such is the greatest triumph. If we are not experiencing joy and happiness in this world, we have to ask ourselves, maybe we are doing something wrong. You know, the easiest way, the best way to overcome this feeling of resentment, this feeling of anger, is to be appreciative, is to be grateful. Think about all the things we have in this world to be happy and appreciative for. Our families, our friends, our uh, health, shelter, or something as simple as food. One of the verses of the Quran, it says, feed the, the poor and the despondent. Now, we know why we feed the poor, because they lack the funds to get the money, but why the despondent, those who are hopeless, those who are just like, you know, utterly depressed? It's because eating food is one of the simplest ways to change the mood of an individual. You think about those taste that hits your, uh, uh, your tongue, the sensation you get, the joy you get from it, if you can just savor that, then all of a sudden you can change your mood. You can think about the things you have, this, this sensation, this system that God created, that he can produce food from the ground with nothing more than water and sun, that you can take a bite of this uh, fruit or chocolate or whatever it is and be able to get joy out of it. But the aspect is, again, we have dulled our senses in this world. Not much different than food, right? Because some people, unless the food is just like, painstakingly spicy, it's going to taste bland to them. It's going to lack flavor. And it's the same thing with life. You know, once you experience rage and you experience this like, <clears throat> you know, hyper uh, sensualization of life and kind of the dynamics that are going on, 
all of a sudden day to day just seems boring. It seems dull. And we crave to find more reasons to get outraged, more reasons to get angry and, you know, get uh, get our blood pressure up. They did this study where they grabbed uh, people and they said, look, we want you to sit in this room. There's no entertainment, no phone, no nothing. And just like meditate for 15 minutes. But in case you get bored, there's this device here that if you touch, it's going to shock you and it's going to hurt. Now, you would think most people would, why would they want to shock themselves? You know, what would be the the, the net benefit of that? But 67% of the male participants and 25% of the female participants could not sit alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes without choosing to shock themselves. Meaning that they prefer to have the sensation of being shocked than they did to just have the dullness of being able to be alive with their thoughts, to be able to meditate, to be able to think about God, to be able to just reflect. You know, meditation is the opposite of hypersensualization. The fact is that, you know, life is great just the way it is. We don't need to add additional anger and outrage in order to live life. This is something that we've done because we fried these circuits that God has given us. That we're constantly seeking more and more reason to get an adrenaline rush, to get, you know, our blood pressure up. And if we meditate and we reflect about on God and we think about all the things we have, then maybe we can experience satisfaction and contentment. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.